Cheers, Richard. Um, so you've let a few uh, cats out of the bag in terms of my uh, my my heritage. I better grab the clicker, I suppose. Um, so so yeah, Dad Dad grew up grew up down the road. Um, played played uh, rugby as a 19 year old from Marlborough, and then uh, jumped the ditch, so to speak. Um, and I grew up on, on the Kerry Coast, as, as, as Richard said. But now now I'm officially a Jaffa. Um, so. Um, and just listening to, to Sam, Sam and, and, um, and some of the other speakers this morning, so I did hear that, that was it 90% of uh, New Zealanders um, rate what, what you and the regions do as farm, in, in farming communities. You know, they really, really, really appreciate the stuff you do for, for growing our, you know, our food and, and, and supplying the world. So that's great. So what I figure is that 10% that must be from Wellington. And therefore, all of Auckland loves you. So you, you talked about Haga, Haga Ginga Day. So I'm going to propose, and it was missed, right? Or you didn't have time for it this year. So I'm going to propose Haga Jaffa Day for you all. Um, now, I, I know that there are some other Jaffas in the room. There's one here. Do you want to put your hand up, um, Andy? Put your hand up. Yep, there's Jaffa. So on your way out, um, give him a hug. Um, he's way better looking than me, so you, 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 you'd prefer to hug him, and if there's any others, any, any other Jaffas in the room? I heard someone was from South Auckland. Don't be shy, put your hand up. If you see them, give them a hug too. Okay, so, um, but my dad, he, he did jump the ditch, um, and you know, he grew up in Blenheim, so he's got lots of stories, and you know, you always hear about how sunny it is here. He jumped the ditch, ended up in the Hutt Valley, and we ended up growing, or I ended up growing up in Stokes Valley. If anyone's been there, it's um, the complete opposite of, um, of, of Blenheim. It's the darkest and dingiest place in the whole of, whole of New Zealand, I believe. And, and I always, I love my dad to bits, but I always tell him, well, you bloody idiot, bloody useless. How did you, how, how did you let mum convince you to move to Stokes Valley, the coldest and dingiest place in New Zealand, and not bring us all back as a family to Blenheim? And I still haven't figured it out, but anyway, he's a good old bugger and, and uh, I love him to bits. So today, um, I've got, got a few things for you. So I've got, we've got about, someone going to give me a nod at 20 minutes, say, I think, is it coming from over there? Yeah, 20 minutes, cool. Um, so we've got to talk about a few things. So COVID impact on New Zealand. Essentially, um, we thought it was going to be bloody bad. Um, it is bad, but not, not quite as bad as we thought. Um, we're going to talk about the agri-sector, of course, what the outlook is, is there, and, and, and sort of mainly refer back to, to COVID. Um, and um, a little bit about China. Um, so China is really important for us as we come out of COVID, but also in terms of um, you know, looking forward. And in, I don't know if you've been, been reading the news, but they're having a bit of a, they're picking on fights with quite a few people at the moment, including the Aussies, have you heard that? Um, <clears throat> they've turned away Aussie coal. Um, so what could they do to us? So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, COVID, COVID in New Zealand. So you can see, here we go, cruising along. This is, this is the economy growing um, through 18, through 19. So it's cruising along, growing, then boom, COVID comes along and that first lockdown. So you can see here, this is how much the economy went backwards in the June quarter, it went backwards 12%. So the biggest ever drop in quarterly, in quarterly GDP, or the biggest contraction in the economy ever. And then we are recovering quite quickly, but we're not going to recover all the way back because we've lost, we've basically lost the tourism sector for now. Um, <clears throat> so a big hit, big hit. Um, and the thing I probably want to emphasise to you all, and, and I, I, you know, I, one, of the, one of the pleasures of my job is getting around the country and, and to places like here in Seddon and, and, and Nelson yesterday. I was up in the, in the, in the NACI last week. Um, but I don't know if you've noticed have you noticed COVID here? How, how big a deal has it been for you? Not that big a deal, right? Not that big a deal, but, but, it, but for the country as a whole, it is a big deal, and for the rest of the world, for our markets, it is massive. Um, I just, just, if you remember back to the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, the world economy contracted by 0.1%. We think, um, through COVID, the world economy is going to contract by 4%. So it's way bigger than the global financial crisis. Um, but, but we're not noticing here in, in places like Sedan or Venom or, or Nelson or, or, um, 
or you know, down the road in Kaikoura. So we're not noticing it, but it is still big. So I'll just to emphasize that it's big and it means going to mean stuff for us. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, just to emphasize how big, um, tourism, you know, second biggest export earner for the country prior to COVID. So here's tourist numbers. These are monthly numbers. So the 300,000 sort of refers to three, 300, uh, sorry, the 300 refers to 300,000 roughly visitors per month. This little, uh, let's see if this dot thing works. There we go. This little blip here. Anyone remember what that was? World Cup. World Cup. Yep, 2011 World Cup. So we got an extra, an extra 50,000 or so visitors uh, during the 2011 World Cup. But you can see a bit of a boom, bit of a boom through these years. Um, so what's it look like now? Like that. Just gone, essentially. So, you know, essentially, if we, if we look at it in terms of the size of the tourism sector, it's about 5% about of the economy. A decent chunk is domestic tourism. But when we, uh, when we uh, look at it, just the international stuff, it's probably the economy is going to be 2 two to 3% smaller as a result of that. But it will come back, you know, assuming we get, you know, we get a vaccine and, and people start to eventually travel again. <laughs> Here's a look at uh, the lockdown and what that did to um, <coughs> um, retail. So this is basically your shopping. Um, and, and this line here, the, the zero line is sort of showing compared to last year. So before the first lockdown, we were running a bit higher, higher than uh, our last year. And as we got, you know, as people caught wind of the lockdown coming, this is all the what? All the toilet paper, yeah? All the toilet paper, loo paper. And then quickly followed by booze, right? Yep. And then boom, here's the lockdown. So this is nationwide retail spending went backwards 60%, right? So big, big drop. And then, and then as we went back, back um, down the levels again, so we came back to pretty much the same level as prior, to, or same level last year. And then the second lockdown. So this was me stuck at home in my apartment in Auckland, twiddling my thumbs going stir crazy. Well, meanwhile, you guys were all having a good time, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's second lock, lockdown. Much smaller, obviously, and a, much, and a pretty, pretty, pretty immediate return to um, the same level largely as this time last year. Right, so unemployment, big, the biggest consequence probably for a lot of people. And again, not, not so much in, in our sector, in the agri sector, but in other sectors, you know, hospitality, all the, think of all the jobs in hospitality at cafes and in restaurants and in tourism. So, and when I said it was, it's bad, but probably not as bad as we thought it would be. Originally, we thought unemployment rate was going to get up to 10%. And it was down here. Whoops. Sorry. I was down here at four. So that's quite a, that's a massive, massive lift over a very short period of time. We thought it was going to get to 10, but things have actually, actually uh, turned out a bit better than we thought. So we now only think it's going to go to about seven. And why has it turned out better than we thought? Well, basically, the first reason is that the, we can actually turn off the lights in, in, in much of the economy and then turn them back on again, and the, the economy is springing back to life pretty well. And the second, the second reason why the economy is, is not as bad as we first feared is that things like the wage subsidy have been a real... They've done really well on that front in terms of putting money into pockets of people who had lost their jobs... They got, it out, got the money out the door really quickly and it's been really effective at cushioning the blow for those people and hence the economy isn't as damaged as we thought it would be. And the other thing as well is interest rates have, have come down to support the economy. That's you know, obviously come from the Reserve Bank. So what else we got? Here's a little bit about debt. So governments, like I said, they've uh, put, pushed out that money in the, in the wage subsidy so they've had to take on some more debt. Um, so while, while um, we say it's not as bad as it might have been, it's still bad. So we do think the Reserve Bank, sorry, the government still needs to, um, to borrow this money to keep the economy going. Um, and hence, hence we still think that um, they are going to borrow, borrow some of that money they've put aside um, <clears throat> earlier in the year. And the other thing is, if this works, we do think the Reserve Bank will will need to keep lowering the, the official cash rate 
and um, they're doing another program as well called funding for lending. So we have got more ammunition coming from the Reserve Bank and that will lead to further falls in interest rates. Um, you probably haven't got time today to go into it, but you'll see that's a negative, negative official cash rate. Um, that doesn't mean negative rates for customers or, or retail in the retail or for, for businesses. So term deposits may get close to zero, but they won't go below zero. And lending rates will still be um, low, but but positive. So there's a little bit of a bit of a bit of a um, bit of a I don't know backdrop to 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 what's going on in our sector and what COVID is meaning for our sector. Um, so let's have a look at our sector and. Can I go backwards? Oh, that one's, yeah, we go. So what, what has been the, the really, um, I guess, heartening thing and comforting thing to a degree is that our sector has performed, you know, the, uh, amongst the best and proved resilient through these times. And the way I've been thinking about it, why is that? Sort of basically four factors have contributed to that resilience. Um, <clears throat> and obviously the first thing, and it's just, it's pretty, pretty simple really, Generally, we're, we're, we're a food producer and we're exporting food. And by and large, um, our markets around the world, our, our, our um, consumers around the world are still eating, right? Just very simply, we export food, making a general statement, and our, our, um, our, client, our markets overseas, they're still eating. They, they're, even if their, their incomes have dropped 10, 20%, they've prioritised food in their budget, so they're still eating. So that's a pretty simple simple view of the world so that's the first reason so number two number two <clears throat> um, you all know these guys um, so <clears throat> you might not know these guys but you can sort of guess where they're from the second question is where are we selling our food or where are we exporting so <clears throat> where our markets are concentrated into Asia and in particular into China our, our exports have fared relatively well compared to if our, our exports are concentrated into, the, into Europe. Yep, five minutes, ooh, okay, cool. Um, into Europe and or um, the US. Basically, the US and Europe, or particularly the, um, the US, they've stuffed up COVID management and their economies have felt the, felt the brunt of that. Whereas in, in China and in other parts of Asia, they've done much better and hence, Hence, um, they have performed well, and market, our, our exports going to those markets have, have performed better. Other thing is premium, premium or not. So essentially, things like venison, very much a premium product, um, and going into restaurants, prices have really, really been hit hard. So how, how far along that sliding scale of, of how premium your product is, that also matters. So that's a little bit of a nuance from just the general food rule. And then the last thing, what are your comp competitors do, doing? What are, what are substitutes doing? So things like wool, for example, where substitutes in the synthetics, you know, the price of oil has dropped a lot. So their competitors or their substitutes in terms of other products have gotten a lot cheaper. And so wool, wool has really struggled. So let's look at our sector's lamb. Yes, it's a food. Um, but are both right, China, China the leading market, but we're still selling some some into the US and some into, into Europe. So a bit, of mi bit mixed on where the market's going. Lamb, again, some, some, um, some premium products, but some cheaper products, so a bit mixed. Um, on the substitutes front, you know, there's not much, not, I mean, there aren't many competitors for lamb directly. It's mainly Aussie. So that hasn't been such a big deal. So overall, lamb's held up. Yes, it's back, back, back from last year when we had $9 a kilo and whatever, but that was an extremely rare event. So $7 roughly what we're getting now. It's a pretty good result and that's kind of because by and large um, the factors underpinning lamb prices have been been okay. Looking at lamb, uh, sorry beef, again similar, similar story here. It's in, in China and the US main markets. Um, you know prime, prime cuts still struggling a little bit but your, 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 your cheaper cuts doing, doing okay. Um, bit more competition for, for beef. Brazil, US, etc. So hence for me the outlook for beef is a bit weaker than, than lamb but nonetheless not too bad and, um, and that's also looking forward as, as well as what we've seen in the last six months or so. 
When we turn to mutton, something like this, again, this is, this is pretty easy. Most of it goes to China. Um, it's not premium, not a lot of competition. So for me, the best outlook is in, in the mutton sector. Um, at least in, the sh in you know, looking, looking over the next six months or the rest of the season, so to speak. Um, whoa. Anyone want to want to have a crack at this? You've got to have a charity somewhere. <laughs> so, <coughs> yeah. Rough. Rough. Um, just on the, you might be going, hang on, don't we send all our wool to China? Yes, we do send most of our wool to China, but where does that, what happens to that wool after it goes to China? It gets manufactured into, into clothes which then goes to the US and Europe. So <coughs> it is exposed heavily to, to those markets. And something like Merino, you know, why would you buy a flash Merino top when you can just purchase a, you know, a much cheaper, cheaper um, product at, at, in these times? So that's the way I've been thinking about um, COVID and the outlook for our, our products. Um, so those four, four sort of um, key, key sort of ideas on what what is driving the outlook in the next um, six to 12 months or so, or, or this season? Is it food? Where are we sending it? Is it, is it China and Asia? You know, that's, that's holding up really well versus is it um, the US or Europe, which is not doing so well? How premium is it? Um, things like, I don't know, if you heard Rocket Apples, for example, they're struggling, but um, you know, Royal Gala is holding up. Or another, another example is um, um, some of the really expensive wines, you know, your $50 or your $40 Pinots, they are struggling, but Sav at, at 15 or 20 bucks is doing okay. So, and then, and then you come to your substitutes, what are your other suppliers doing? <clears throat> um, so we must be running out of time. So what, what else have I got here? I don't think I've got too much. Oh, here's just your charts. So I'll skip through these. I've sort of said the outlooks for those. Um, the China paradox, basically, um, this is the thing, China, China performing really well. So growth, I can point, can I? Growth here actually staying positive. You look at um, us, US and Eurozone, negative growth this year, but China actually positive. The only major economy that's going to grow this year. So that's, so that's the hence that if your market, if you're exposed to, exposed to China and Asia to a degree, um, you're likely to fare a little bit better, all else equal. Here's the shares of meat going to China, so some chunky, chunky amounts of meat going to China. But what I've looked at, and I, I published a paper last week, and you may, you may want to jump on the Westpac web, uh, website and have a look. There's also a, a sense of, it's not just how much we export to China, but how strategic or how much, how much um, or how reliant China is on us. That also determines how vulnerable we are to China changing its mind on New Zealand. At the moment, we're pretty friendly. They like us more than they like the Aussies. They definitely like us more than they like the Americans. But there is that risk that Winston or someone like that puts their foot on it and they get pissed off, right? So where are we, where are we at most risk? We're at most risk in the, in, the, in the markets or the export sectors where they don't need us. So where don't they need us? They don't need us on tourism. They don't need us on seafood. They don't need us on gold kiwi fruit in particular. Um, <clears throat> because basically if they choose, they can go, right, piss off New Zealand, we don't need that. And in, say, for tourism, they can go, right, no one's going, all, all Chinese tourists, you now have to go to Italy or Thailand or Peru. They don't need to send um, half a million Chinese to New Zealand anymore. Boom, gone, no, no Chinese tourists in New Zealand. Very easy for them to pick on, on, on those sectors. But not as easy to pick on, sorry, not as easy to pick on dairy, not as easy to pick on wine. Wine, basically, because they don't drink much, so it doesn't really matter. Dairy, they get half of their imported dairy from us. So we matter to them. So if they want to pick a fight with us, they're much less likely to pick a fight with us on dairy. Uh, what else? Uh, forestry, kind of in the middle. Um, fruit, the rest of fruit, so your apples and the like, in the middle. Where does our sector sit? <coughs> Sorry, where are we doing here? Beef, sheep meat, roughly in the middle. Um, and the, the kind of proof is in the pudding, right? Um, a few of you probably supply Silver Fern Farms. Who are they owned by? Owned by the Chinese, why is that? Why have they come to New Zealand and bought, a, uh, bought into a, a meat cooperative? Because it's important. So, <coughs> 
what we're saying is, yeah, there is some risk. You know, things, things like lamb, we are quite dependent in terms of how much we send, but at the same time, they do need us to a degree as well. So it's not as risky as something where they don't need us as all. So that's a little bit of a framework um, I developed and published on last week. You're more than welcome to um, have, a, have a look at that on the Westpac website. And um, also I publish a monthly, um, month, monthly publication called Monthly Meat Matters. So the question was around quantitative easing, so that's basically very cheap money um, <clears throat> into the financial system. And what does that mean for food prices? Yeah? hyperinflation that it's going to cause. Well, yeah, okay, so the idea is we want inflation. Um, so the idea is the economy has slowed right down, so we need to get the economy going again. And part of the um, sort of the way that we know it is, it is working again is that we get inflation. So in other words, we get some um, measured increase in prices. So that's the idea. At the moment, we're at the risk that prices start falling, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's a symptom of basically economy contracting and really struggling. Um, so... A little bit to, to give a little bit of a twist, I mean, in general, I, I'm bullish on food prices generally. So, um, <clears throat> and even in this time when we've seen the, the biggest hit to global, the global economy in our lifetimes and probably that we'll ever see, food prices have held up reasonably well, right? Um, <clears throat> so, in general, I think food prices are kind of immune to what's going on in the, in the, in the economic cycle to a degree. And then looking forward, um, you know, I see um, essentially food prices being higher than the rest of general prices um, because essentially the world is, going to, is so, sh in the next 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, the world is short water and, and, and land. And we've got all these other constraints coming on, the production of food, i.e. environmental constraints. So, so in general, I think food, food inflation, so food price increases, are going to be higher than the average price increase, which at the end of the day is good for, good for our sector, right?